you know, our, we have to work with our grain producers. You know, we're not against you um, and they're not against us. We, we need to look at how can we work together? You know, you guys are sequestering carbon. We're sequestering carbon. We're doing our job. Let's and you know, we're providing food for the world. Welcome to another episode of the Beef Podcast Show. My name is Dr. Stephanie Hansen. I'm a feedlot nutritionist at Iowa State University, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's guest. So today we have Jeff Semler joining us. His research is primarily in two ongoing projects at the Western Maryland Research and Education Center. The first of these is related to small ruminant research, and the second investigates forage production methods under both conventional and organic management. His academic background includes a bachelor's in animal science from West Virginia University and a master's in animal science from the University of Connecticut, where he emphasized the area of physiology of reproduction. So now, along with four other faculty members and seven staff, he's a part of the extension education team charged with serving the residents of Washington County. So welcome to the show, Jeff. Thank you. Excellent. Well, I'm excited to visit with you here today. We were kind of chatting in the pre-show uh, that you'd be the first guest that I've had so far, who's really been pretty significantly east of the Mississippi. And so um, maybe as a part of kind of telling us your origin story and how you got passionate about the beef industry, maybe you can also help our international audience understand why we think that's even interesting to, to bring up as part of our introduction. Okay. So uh, I guess Beef for me goes all the way back to being in 4-H. Um, I started with a, with beef steers back as a 4-H'er. -er. Um, for those that are into the Angus breed, uh, I even had some steers sired by Y um, Angus bulls. Um, and that was a long time ago. Uh, but uh, so I got into beef cattle and cattle in general, um, you know, as a 4-H'er -er, some, you know, uh, 50 years ago, I guess, or what well more than that but anyway um and here in the east you know we uh were predominantly small farms um in in my valley so i'm in the in the um cumberland valley hagerstown valley shenandoah valley depends on what state you're in what we call it 90 minutes um west of washington dc and baltimore maryland and uh this is a area that was farmed um, set by, you know, centuries by Germans. Uh, we moved out of Pennsylvania. As I tell people, uh, the, this valley is the same geologically and sociologically from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to Harrisonburg, Virginia. Um, and it was just basically Germans that came into Pennsylvania and just kept moving down the valley. And some of them would stop and some of them would keep going. And so that's the influence of the um, area. You'll see a lot of a German style bank barns. Uh, most of them had dairy cows in them at one time. And uh, Washington County, Maryland is still the number one dairy county in the state of Maryland. Uh, we have uh, just slightly less than 110 farms, dairy farms in our county. Um, they're small farms. Uh, average cow herd would be about 100. So that's one of the emphasis of my extension program here is certainly dairy and forage production um, from that perspective. Uh, growing up, like I said, in 4-H, um, I went to West Virginia for an animal science degree. Probably couldn't have picked a better school uh, in hindsight because I took sheep production, I took swine production, I took beef production, I took dairy production, I took all those. I wasn't a dairy science major or a beef major. And when it came back to being an extension educator in Washington County, Maryland, um, it kind of fits the whole gamut of those things. Went to Connecticut um, because I was a judging team coach. Uh, they hired me as a graduate assistant and I uh, got my master's in the physiology of reproduction. Primarily, we did work with um, uh, estrus synchronization. We were uh, doing um, cedar type work before it was cedars. We put a pagestin implant in the ear. Um, if you re go back to the old synchromate B system, so uh, we were using a prostaglandin and a progestin implant uh, using seven day and nine day. Uh, that was my master's research project. At the time it was underwritten by a company named Hoffman LaRoche um, who doesn't exist in that form anymore. Um, 
Cyril made the progestin implant and they stopped making those. And so anyway, a pregnant pause until somebody figured out a cedar would work and we do the same thing. You just don't have to cut things out of their ear anymore. So, which is kind of nice. Animal health is constantly threatened by the exposure of mycotoxins in feed. The monitoring of fungal toxins has become indispensable in the feed industry and in animal production. DSM offers a range of analytical services to assess the mycotoxin contamination and solutions to combat mycotoxins. Learn more at dsm.com forward slash mycotoxin dash survey. That's interesting. Okay, I actually have lots of follow-up questions. Um, this is going to be maybe kind of circuitous, but let's start with um, some of the differences in extension educator type roles. So we've got everybody has kind of different vocabulary across different states. Sometimes they're specialists, sometimes they're educators, sometimes they're one species focused, sometimes they have multiple spe species focused. And um, I kind of keyed in when you were talking there about getting a broad livestock background across species. Um, so talk to us a little bit more about, you know, what do you see in a day-to-day -day role in your job? Like you're not just working with beef customers, um, but you're also working with lots of other ones. Actually, I go back to the old moniker. I use the word extension agent, but, um, and, and I'm, I'm from nuts to soup when it comes to agriculture in Washington County. When I, I already referenced my 4-H career, um, there were four ag agents in this county when I was um, in 4-H. One did fruit, one did dairy, one did agronomy, um, and one did home horticulture. Today we have a home horticulture person and myself, so I cover everything else. I don't cover fruit. Um, we have a fruit specialist that does that, but um, I'll, a typical day I could be answering a question about a backyard chicken flock, or I could be answering questions about um, right now we're in a drought. So what kind of emergency forage can we plant um, this fall to uh, mitigate some of our forage shortage for a dairy farmer or, you know, for a beef farmer? Uh, so it, it's kind of broad um, here. Again, Maryland is a, is a small state and our agri even though agriculture is the number one industry in the state, um, we still don't have a, a ton of um, extra staff. Um, and I am primarily a county-based educator or agent, if you will. Uh, not that I don't answer questions from across the state. We're really thin when it comes to animal scientists. So I do work with dairy farms and beef farmers all over the state, although I'm not a specialist per, trip, per se. Um, so I, I'm very familiar with dairy farms on the Eastern shore, as well as the ones here on the Western shore. So let's see, so you've been in extension for- 35 almost years. 35 years. Okay. So you've been in extension for like a couple of days. You've got this, you've had some experience. How have you seen extension change in the sense of, you know, you basically describe that you have to be a jack of all trades, right? And you may not know anything about that phone call that you get that topic, but that producer or that client is depending on you to help them figure out an answer. How have technology changes and things like that, that have happened over the last 35 years helped you facilitate some of those, you know, services to your clients? Well, certainly, you know, I tell people I'm really an information broker. I, I don't have to know everything. I just have to know where to find it. And obviously with the advent of the internet, I mean, I, I get the Iowa State um, beef bulletin. Um, so, I mean, that's just one of the many things that I, that I get from, you know, email subscriptions. Uh, so, you know, the internet has changed everything and to me you know if it doesn't have dot edu you shouldn't probably use it but that's another whole story there uh, but there's a there's a lot of information uh, available to not just myself but to, to the general public if you know where to find it and of course we have i already mentioned the fruit we have fruit specialists so i have fruit and vegetable specialists that i can rely on locally that i can send an email a photograph again all that we, we carry in our pocket now you know, a camera that's world-class, the only thing is the person using it, that's the only difference. Um, and we, computing power in my pocket that was more powerful than the first desktop I had. So those kind of things really allow us, you know, to do a lot of things that, you know, our predecessors could have never done. I can be in the field, I can take a picture, I can send it to a specialist. Sometimes before I even leave the field, I have an answer. 
Uh, so the technology is is a wonderful thing. I mean, not even to mention GPS and all the other things we can do, mapping. And, and you know, when we started out a few years ago now with an infestation of brown marmorated stink bugs and the infestation and what it was doing to vegetable crops, you know, we could put a pin in a map where we had an infestation um, with our cell phone. And, you know, you know, my predecessors could have never done that. I mean, you know, those, they'd have put them in a jar and took them back to the office and got out a map and put a pin in a map and, you know, and so on and so forth. So, uh, and then they, they got on the telephone and shared that information. So it, it's, uh, you know, technology, you know, it's a blessing and a curse, uh, uh, you know, as you well know, because we don't even know we're the most of one of the most developed countries in the world. I don't get cell service everywhere. <laughs> Um, you know, and those kind of things. So, uh, but you know, again, I can still store that image on a cell phone and carry it back to the office or, or somewhere else. Boy, it's hard to imagine not having cell service somewhere on the East Coast. I mean, I've been in a lot of remote places in the Intermountain West where I, I get not having cell service, but you wouldn't think 90 miles outside of Baltimore or DC, you wouldn't have service. It, it is really amazing to me. Um, as a matter of fact, if I someone called me on my cell phone right now, I would have to walk to the window of my office to get enough reception to take that call. And I'm like you. I, I Well, I guess it's a little bit different. I was in Georgia, and I'm talking about the former Soviet Republic. We're up on the Alpine zone that overlooks the disputed border with Turkey, and my interpreter gets a cell phone call and takes it. And I have to lean against the window in my office. To get us to, to get a, a cell phone signal. So, you know, it is what it is. It is true. You get a better signal up on a mountain. There's a um, Medicine Bow National Forest has like a whole whole area in kind of southeast corner of Wyoming. Very poor cell service in a lot of places. And I remember one time my phone rang and we were up above, I'm like sitting up in a mountain kind of looking down and this lake was called Telephone Lake. And I looked at my friend I was traveling with and I said, do you think it's called Telephone Lake because you can get a cell signal here? I was like, surely not. <laughs> you never know. I mean, you know, we crossed the Great Divide in uh, um, Yellowstone this couple of weeks ago with my wife, and that's when we got our text message. That is super true. Um, well, first of all, I love Yellowstone. That's an amazing park. Um, but I've taken a domestic travel course with some of my undergrads from Iowa State. We've gone through and we've gone out as far as west as Yellowstone, um, which is very cool for like kids from this part of the country and yours too, right? It's very intensive. Our cows don't have to move very many steps right. to get a good bite of grass. Right. Super different out west where it's very extensive. And we talk to rangers about wolves. And then we talk to, to producers who live outside of Yellowstone who have to deal with the impacts of having wolves next door who don't understand park boundaries and things like that. But yeah, I remember the same thing. The students would be just complaining the entire time. I don't have a cell signal. I'm like, get off your damn phone. You should be looking out the window, looking for wolves or looking for bison or whatever we're doing here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> have you seen on um, the, I, well, I know it's on the iPhone, you can take a photo and then there's a little eye with a little um, like plus signal next to it. And if you click on that, it will run a Google search on that image and you can instantly identify a plant. I mean, you got to be careful about what sources come up, but I've loved that for like identifying trees in my yard to figure out what things are. Yep, it is very handy. I've done that with a few of the weeds that are kind of new to our area. And yeah, you do have to, again, uh, I look at .gov, .edu kind of sources, not um, the .coms, not that there aren't good sources out there, but when I'm standing in the middle of a field, I don't have time to vet, to kind of vet a, a, a resource too thoroughly. So um, I kind of go to the defaults. Absolutely. So uh, let's transition a little bit and talk about um, some of the challenges that you face. So I know that there are some real pros and some real cons to being there on that I-95 corridor. You've got a huge population base, so you've got a market, um, but you've got a huge population base. So you've got some other challenges that, that come with that. So tell us a little bit about from the beef side um, of the clientele that you work with or even your, your own business what do you think are some of the challenges and opportunities for raising cattle there in that part of the country? Well, the, the one of the challenges is our farms are small because um, we have to compete for land, not just with developers, but with row crop farmers. Um, uh, Purdue, uh, one of the large uh, multinational uh, poultry producers is here in Maryland. 
Um, so they like to buy corn, wheat, and soybeans as close to home as they can. Uh, we have um, some flour mills up in um, Pennsylvania that buy uh, wheat from us. Uh, ours is soft wheat. If you're not familiar with the East, we don't grow hard red winter. Um, we grow a lot of winter wheat, but it's all soft wheat. Um, so think biscuits and, and your cakes and that kind of thing. Uh, the other challenges we have is, again, we're very patchwork. So in my um, other side of my life, the cows we run, we run on four different farms and they range from um, 30 acres to, you know, 165 acres uh, and, and, and a little bit in between there. So those are kind of the challenges that, that any farmer in, in the East has, uh, not just in Maryland, but we have, we don't sit down and even row crop farmers, they don't sit down and plant 100 acres. They plant 15 acres here, 40 acres there. Maybe they're lucky on the eastern shore to have 100 acre fields where it's flat and sandy, but we don't have it here um, in, in this valley. Um, so it's very piecemeal. Some of the opportunities, as you said, is we have a ready clientele of um, farmers market type customers um, that love to um, shake the hand of the person that grew whatever they're buying, whether it's tomatoes or a gallon of milk or a beef steak. Uh, and so that's a that's an advantage. A lot of those folks uh, live and work in the metropolitan area, and they don't mind parting um, with a sizable amount of money. Uh, and I tell any of my clientele that are retailers, your competition is not Walmart. Okay, they need to understand that they've got a quality product and a story to tell, and they need to do their math and charge an appropriate um, amount of uh, money for that at retail. Uh, as a friend of mine who retailed milk in those farmers markets says, Cadillac does not apologize for the price of their car. Uh, and so you need to think about it in that way. And again, those folks love to hear stories. They're, they're still a little romantic, but um, they like to hear about how we produce food and, and there's a lot of type, that type of engagement. Um, we've been fortunate that we don't get a lot of the negative side of, of the folks that want to complain about animal agriculture. Uh, but my daughter tells me that, well, that's because we're a pasture-based system. And I should say it out loud, I have nothing against a feedlot, but I don't have a place to feed cattle. So. Um, so my calves go out the door as wean calves, um, bunk trained, but wean calves. And, uh, you know, we just, um, you know, we have a pastoral setting. So maybe that does ring true uh, to some folks. Uh, but again, that's when it comes to economics, we got to feed our cows cheap. And I tell people my cattle get minerals, water, grass and sunshine. Hey, I'm happy to hear minerals are on there. <laughs> well, they do. Um, but, you know, and, and sure, we feed hay. I mean, I'm not going to lie about that, but, you know, we're not feeding a, a ton of grain because it's a cost. It's an input cost. And at the end of the day, profit's kind of what we're looking at. So let me um, ask a couple of questions before we maybe talk about some of the challenges of being on that I-95 corridor. So one of them, maybe to help our listeners understand, tell us a little bit about your climate there. What kind of like annual precipitation do you get? Um temperatures, things like that. So we live, you're, we're in the mid Atlantic. So we're kind of, you know, Maryland's called the old line state. You know, we were, we're kind of in the middle. We weren't North, we weren't South uh, when it came to that conflict. Um, and so we get the best and worst of everything. Uh, you know, it's hot and humid here. Um, the past couple weeks, we've had uh, temperatures in the nineties and humidity and 85 and above. Uh, we're, we're now experiencing a drought. So from that perspective, annual rainfall, we're going to hit about 40 inches. So I know everybody in Wyoming just went, oh, you're kidding me. Um, but <laughs> um, I also don't deal with their wind and snow and cold weather uh, either. Uh, winter times, you know, it, it ranges from we've had winters where we didn't get any snow at all. Do we'll have winters where we might end up with, you know, 36 inches of snow overnight. Um, it, it, it just depends. 
because of the way wa uh, weather flows in our country, um, if it comes out of the south in the wintertime, get out your snowblower. Um, if it comes out of the south in the summer summertime, um, put on your hip waders. Uh, it's it's one of those things. Most of the time, our, our weather comes from the north or the west, uh, but in the summertime, when we get the tropical depressions that come on shore, we can get some fairly significant rainfall. If it sits here and spins, it just depends on the track. Um, you know, and, and it's one of those things, everybody can name them. You know, 1972 was Hurricane Agnes, and 1985 was another hurricane. But they, they're unusual. They Usually, we just catch the tail end of them. So we'll get two or three inches of rain at the, at the end of August, which is great. You know, now we can plant our wheat and our pasture for renovating pasture. You know, our corn and beans are done, but, you know, we can still uh, take advantage of some of that fall moisture. Uh, and, you know, like I said, it's normally hot and humid. You know, we, we, we complain about it all the time, like everybody complains about weather. But then we usually finish a sentence with, it's July in Maryland. What do you expect? Um, so that's the kind of uh, climate we have. So, okay, so I think that tees us up to some questions about this forage base that you've referenced a couple of times. So first off, tell us a little bit about what type of forage, you know, so if you're talking about raising cow-calf, you know, kind of things or sheep or anything else out there, what are you grazing? And then the other thing I want to talk a little bit about is you mentioned, um, you know, grain production and things like that, maybe from pressure from the poultry industry. And so that's useful. Is there much for cover crop um, work going on out there or utilization of that to, to be additional forage resources for the beef side? So let's start with, we're predominantly grazing cool season perennial pastures. And a lot of our you know, species are orchard grass, bluegrass, if you don't manage your pastures very well, um, broom grass, and we have a Kentucky 31 fescue. So that's, that's kind of the the bane and the backbone of the forage beef industry um, in this country. Think, you know, Arkansas, Missouri, well, Maryland. Um, we're, we're kind of the same type of situation. Uh, and, and so that's primarily, again, if you're, if you're fortunate enough to um, have some crop land that you know, you've been either been able to keep for yourself or wrestle out of a, we will plant some warm season annuals. So we'll plant some Sudan grass and then come behind it with maybe triticale or, or, or oats and triticale to graze through the winter and, or the fall and winter, spring type thing. Um, that's not um, common because again, for a competition, but we do another one of my research projects at, the, at our farm is we're grazing summer and winter annuals with um, stalkers and lambs. Uh, so right now they're on Sudan grass and some other millet, some other summer annuals and they'll go into a triticale, um, oats, crimson clover, cocktail. Um, there's more than that, but in the fall. So, so there is some of that that, that happens. Um, we have some dairy farms that will graze that as well. Our biggest challenge, and, I, and it's not from talking to uh, friends out west, it's not unusual. We have a hard time grazing stalks. And we have a hard time grazing cover crops because of infrastructure. So our our cover crops in Maryland are, are, are very well established. Our corn, wheat, and soybean guys will plant cover crops, but we don't have fence and we don't have water in order to graze them. So sometimes they get chopped. If they're a dairy farm, they're chopping that triticale in the spring. But if they're a, a commercial a grain producer, they're burning that rye down and they're planting, you know, their next crop into it. Uh, and so that's our, you know, that's a big challenge for us is we don't have the, the infrastructure to, to put it on those acres. So I'm curious, uh, I had written down a question to ask you as well. When I think about your part of the country, I think about some of the water quality challenges that have happened. Is that part of the impetus for why the crops folks are more aggressive with getting cover crops down? Or has there been different incentives because it's still very hit or miss in this part of the country. So you're in Maryland. We have the largest estuary in the United States, the Chesapeake Bay, and that drives policy. And so uh, Maryland farmers have been paid an incentive to plant cover crops. 
for a, for a number of years. Uh, in some cases, they could get up to, depending on their management, and there's a tiers of these payments, but as much as $85 per acre uh, to plant cover crops. Uh, and we started out, and it's, it's kind of funny because, uh, well, it's not really funny to us, but policy and science don't always walk hand in hand. And so we had to fight to get cover crop cocktails um, accepted into the cover crop program. Everybody was in love with rye. And I understand that to, to a, on a certain level. Rye is a great scavenger, root mass, the whole nine yards. But there's so many other things that we could do, especially when we're talking about utilizing some of those forages in other systems. And so triticale, we got that in, we can plant triticale, we can plant car, uh, crimson clover with it. You know, some things that, you know, you and I don't think are rocket science or rocket science to, to folks that are driving policy. Uh, but so, yeah, the Chesapeake Bay made all the difference for our farmers as far as incentivizing planting cover crops. That's interesting because, of course, being here in Iowa, we would have a rather large body of water that's a few states south of us, right, that could could definitely benefit from continued keeping nitrogen here instead of letting nitrogen and other things go there. Um, so related question then, thinking kind of circling back to the for earlier question about things that have changed in your 35 years in extension, I'm thinking about things like virtual fencing. And I know that they don't work well if there's not a permanent perimeter fence, at least so far. But I'm curious about what your thoughts are in terms of how some of the technologies we're starting to see, like virtual fencing, might help open up opportunities to be able to get cows out onto those cover crop acres. That's that's certainly something we'd like to look at from our extension standpoint. And we have... Uh, to the south, we've been working, when I say we, I have a forage specialist that I work very closely with, and she visited a farm in Virginia, just south of us, that's using this virtual fencing with goats. Uh, I think virtual fencing could be a, a, a boon for us once we get it to an affordable price. Uh, right now, it's, it's too pricey to, to really be practical, but I remember when you know, cell phones were expensive and, and, you know, other things. So you, even solar panels, you think about what they cost before and, and what they're coming down to now. And, and which is the, the fact that solar panels are coming down in prices is, is actually opening some doors for agriculture because now we can put more pipe under those panels, get them up off the ground, we can graze under them. Our biggest challenge earlier was they wouldn't put any more pipe on them because it was too expensive. The margins were too tight. And so that's going to, I think, going to really be a bit of a game changer a little bit, when, it, especially with small ruminants, actually sheep, because they don't climb like goats. But, uh, you know, you, there's too much pipe you got to put on them to put stalkers, and nobody wants stalkers or anything else rubbing against their panels. So, uh, but I think from the, you know, we see it, North of us in Pennsylvania, Vermont, and so on, a lot of guys are grazing under panels. Um, we're starting to see some of that in, in our area now uh, as new um, places doing this installation. I wonder if there'll be increasing opportunity for producers as maybe like carbon credits or other things like that happen as we start to figure out the value of carbon sequestration of some of these forage bases and then capturing that as a, a meat product by having cows graze it. Maybe that in combination with some of the technological changes and prices getting better on those technologies will ultimately come together here in the next decade or so to allow us to, you know, even just having flexibility, right? So we have a year like this where we've got a significant amount of drought across the country and being able to say, well, I know that I don't have much hay put up for the winter, but if I could capture some cover crop gra grazing opportunities, that could that could really be useful. And I think, you know, that's how producers are going to have to start thinking. Mm -hmm. I would agree. And I think the other thing is we, that we in the forage industry have to get as good of press people as the foresters do. Um, because everybody talks about carbon sequestration and they talk about a tree. But if you think about a pasture or even, I'll even go as far as row crops. Um, 
you know, we're, we're producing a lot of carbon and we're, we're moving it around and, and things like that. Like you said, whether it's in flesh or whatever. Um, but we need to get a better PR firm um, involved because we don't get enough credit for that kind of thing. Well, I always say that the biggest strength and the biggest weakness of beef industry is the same thing, and that's its independence, right? We're pretty resilient to a lot of things that the more integrated friends that we have on the monogastric side are not resilient to. But we have a, we just don't speak with one voice, and often that's because we don't have one opinion within the you know just like in the state of Iowa, we have like twenty five thousand beef producers, right? It's it's insane. We can't even have enough extension folks to get to talk to all those people, let alone try to get them all in one room and have the same you know voice for something. But but you're right. So you know what are ways that is that something that extension can take a lead in in terms of you know having the voice for forage, or is that got to be you know, some of the, you know, Frank Mintlower and some people like that from UC Davis or some of the stuff that CSU is doing now with their ag stuff. I can't remember the name of their center, um, but really focus on climate stuff, right? Like, is that an opportunity for forage value as carbon sequestering tools to kind of rise to the forefront? I think, you know, I think it's going to be a combination of that. I mean, I certainly think, you know, Frank's, you know, the, the been our spokesman for a long time. Uh, I guess I first ran into him at the Texas A&M beef cattle short course several years ago. And, and I think, you know, as long as extension um, is viable, we need to try to bring people together. And that's actually been our, always been our strength. And so I think that's going to, we're going to need to continue to do that maybe on a, a little grander scale, if you will. Uh, you're right. A good, good uh, he's a retired farmer now, but he says, yeah, you know, Two farmers couldn't walk across the, the field carrying a bucket of manure without throwing it on each other. Uh, but, you know, if you attack them, they're going to come together. And I think, and I don't mean in an, in a, an attack in a negative way, but, you know, from the perspective of defending our industry, I think that's one of the strengths where we can maybe take some of those differences out of the equation uh, because we we have to be a, have a united front. We can't. We have enough detractors outside of the industry that let's not fight inside of the industry. Let's try to get along. I'll, I'll live with the fact that you run Hereford Cattle. I'll, I'll be okay with that. I, I won't talk to you, Church, but I'll be okay with that. But you know, when it comes to attacking the beef industry or defending the beef industry, I'll put it that way, and and the forage. And, and those kind of things. I think we have to we have to come together on that. And I think it, it crosses those lines. You know, again, we like to live in silos, no pun in, or pen, pun intended. Um, you know, our, we have to work with our grain producers. You know, we're not against you, um, and they're not against us. We we need to look at how can we work together. You know, you guys are sequestering carbon. We're sequestering carbon. We're doing our job. Let's and you know we're providing food for the world, so let's kind of get our story out there and let's not backbite about it. You know, um, if we need to actually have you know a, a, a disagreement, let's go out behind the barn where nobody can see us and hit each other in the mouth and let's come out as a united front. Not that we're condoning physical violence. No, we're not <laughs> condoning physical violence. Those are all metaphorical, but um, yeah, I, I think one of my concerns, like thinking about carbon credits and things like that, is that I have. I have a legitimate concern that the person doing the grazing, owning the cows at that stage is going to somehow find themselves without being the person who can capture the value of that credit, that somebody down the pipeline is going to want to buy that credit, but not maybe pay the value that it should. I don't know. I've, I'm definitely not up to speed on wherever we sit with carbon credit stuff, but I just, you're right. Like everybody's contributing to it. Everybody's got the opportunity to improve it. And so we have to work together. Well, I have the same fear you do um, when it comes to that. It always seems like no matter what these credit programs are, usually when you look down, the farmer's holding the short end of the rope. Um, and that's that's kind of one of those things. The other thing is it allows what I call, you know, allows other people to sin and you know, kind of get if you will, um, admonition from the hard work that you're doing and not always you capturing the full value of that. Yeah, absolutely. 
I want to circle back to actually something you said way back when you were giving us your introduction, and that was talking about how important growing up in 4-H was and having Angus cattle and, you know, kind of how that set you forward on this path. And I'm, I'm curious, we were actually just looking at our demographics yesterday for the Department of Animal Science at Iowa State, and we have about 30% of our incoming students who come from a farm background, you know, that there's a lot of definitions of farm there. So that, that might be, it, that might be variable, but I'm guessing that you probably do not have that high percentage of kids that are going to be coming from a farm background. How in that part of the country are you guys helping to facilitate in, you know, getting the next generation of students interested in ag, even if they didn't have the benefit of being raised on any kind of farm operation? Well, you're right. The University of Maryland um, is not a high farm kid school, for sure. Uh, as as we talked in the pre-conversation, um, a lot of our ag-based kids, we export. They come to your way um, out west, Iowa, Kansas, Oklahoma, Virginia, Tech, those kind of places. Uh, but what we're doing, um, two years ago, we started an internship program in extension. We, we were able to get a grant. So we're trying, I mean, it's it's very small scale, no question about it. We don't have hundreds of interns, uh, but we're trying to attract those types of college students that may, a lot of them are coming out of an environmental science type backgrounds. Um, so that's a plus uh, for us. We can now tell our story to where to some folks that we oftentimes think of as adversaries, uh, but that's worked well. Uh, our FFA and 4-H programs are pretty robust in Maryland, uh, so that also helps a little bit. Uh, judging programs, uh, Maryland has had a, a pretty good 4-H and FFA um, livestock and dairy judging uh, component for a long time, and so they get the interest. They may go off into other uh, branches of the industry, but uh, they, they certainly are in agriculture. A lot of them end up in, a, whether it's banking or pharmaceuticals or anything along those lines, uh, there's a lot of, of that that goes on. And we still get the occasional, um, you know, kid that gets a degree and comes back home. Uh, you know, that's not, un, un, that's not unheard of here either, but uh, certainly we don't have a lot of farmers um, and, and so we have a lot of uh, you know, non-traditional type of ag students, if you will. But sometimes it's amazing to me that you can light a passion in those folks. And uh, I mean, we have a, we had a program here in Maryland. We still do. It's called the dairy leasing program. So you can lease a dairy calf and you can show it. And in Anne Arundel County, which if you don't know where Anne Arundel County is, it's almost smack between Washington in Baltimore and the old Naval Academy dairy farm. We had a 4-H club there, still have a 4-H club there. And a young lady that showed a dairy calf at that particular place is a county extension agent in Wisconsin. And she, and that was her, you know, front door, if you will, into agriculture. Uh, and we have a lot of those type of stories. And I'm sure there's those types of stories in Wisconsin and Maine and Iowa and you know California for that matter, uh, but that those those youth programs uh, do a lot of, of good that way. And again, like I said, we have a, here in Washington County and and actually the, most of the state of Maryland, we have a fairly robust FFA program as well. And so that um, that helps keep those young people connected to agriculture. And we have a team from Boonesboro, a local high school here, that's going to the national contest in meat science. And that was, that's almost unheard of in Maryland. Um, you know, but that's the kind of thing that we, we got these suburbanites, if you will. I mean, these kids all live in developments, but they go to a high school, they're in FFA, and they got into this type of an activity. And now they're looking forward to wearing bump caps and white frocks and going into a cooler. I mean, you know, so that's kind of exciting, um, actually, uh, for us. And that's awesome. I just as you were talking about there, it actually gave me goosebumps when you were talking about the gal going from getting the opportunity to rent a dairy calf and show it to be going to the dairy state right of Wisconsin in terms of being an extension agent there. It's 
it's kind of Jeff right up there with trying to find a better marketing firm to tell our story of the benefits of forage that if we can get um, a more concerted effort across the beef industry or any of animal ag to help these students and younger students, especially get exposure to our industries, you're totally right. I see that light bulb moment happen all the time in the student who didn't think they were going to be interested in nutrition and they came to go to vet school and only vet school or, you know, they hadn't taken a swine class and then they are in Laura Griner's class and she's, you know, helping them do stuff with pigs or whatever. And, and they're suddenly like, oh, there's something more than a cat and a dog. And, you know, that's amazing. Yep. It sure is. And it, it's, it's, that's one of the things about our internship program. You know, we had two interns this, I had two interns this summer and, you know, one is, is vet school bound, but wants to do food animal agriculture that, you know, not a dog and cat. So that, and, and I think we just reinforced that. She comes out of a 4-H background. She raised goats and, and horses in, in 4-H. And, and so that's very, and then the other student is, is a, uh, was an environmental science student and she's very much, she actually wants to be an extension agent now. And so, you know, that's kind of exciting too, that, that you know, and, and, you know, they've got a long road in front of them. So where they actually end up is another story. But uh, those are some some really exciting things to, to be part of. And, and I think you're right. We just have to keep telling our story and we keep you know telling it louder and, and trying to get those folks to take a chance to take that, you know, animal science course or whatever it might be. I know I'm an animal scientist, so I'm a little biased, but take that plant science course and, and you know, You might learn something. You might really find something that's a passion. Absolutely. We have a time and labor saving product for you. Beef and Dairy Agrislat by Healthy Farms is your solution. No more lugging jugs around the barn every month. With Beef and Dairy Agrislat, you simply drop the slat through the floor twice a year, and it works to break down solids, reduces crusting and forming. To learn more, visit MyHealthyFarms.com. Well, I think that that is going to be a great place to start moving towards the wrap up here for our time together today, Jeff. So are you ready for our famous three questions? I am. Okay. So question number one is what is your favorite beef resource? I would say my favorite beef resource would be, um, I I named one of them. I'm, I'm really big into Iowa State, K-State and Nebraska's. Um, websites and there I'm subscribed to all three of their uh, newsletters so I get uh, a newsletter weekly from K-State and monthly from Iowa and and Nebraska Um, I know they're west of the Mississippi and I know we can't always apply everything but I know you guys can teach us a lot about grazing stalks because we let a lot of stalks in the ground or on the ground and and some other things so they they would be my number um I would say my number one resources. Excellent. Actually, um, you were talking about doing some Sudan research earlier, and uh, Mary Dronowski at Nebraska is currently doing some Sudan research. So maybe that'll be a topic that comes out in a beef watch or um, Mm -hmm. something in the future. Yep, sure. (laughs) Okay. Question number two, what is something not related to beef that you are reading or watching or otherwise consuming right now? Well, right now, for me, it's the Women's World Cup. Um, I'm a huge soccer or football fan, if you will. Um, And primarily, I follow the English Premier League, but with the World Cup going on, um, even with the Americans uh, bowing out um, rather ungracefully, um, I'm pulling for England. Sorry, Spain. Um, So we'll see how that goes. But I I enjoy, uh, in another part of my life, uh, for 15 years, I coached um, high school girls soccer. So I'm, and I raised daughters. So I'm kind of a little bit biased when it comes to that. Uh, but certainly, um, it's my favorite sport by far. The, I guess a close second would be college football. But um, and being a Mountaineer, you know, we've lost to Iowa State more than our fair share. I, I would say. I have to say, I always find the women's sports actually more engaging than the men's sports. I don't know why, but I feel like I don't know. Like even like our women's basketball versus our men's basketball, both great, tremendous teams. Right. But the women are really fun to watch. I don't even know what it is, but they're really fun to watch. Yeah. Well, a little true confession. My wife and I are huge fans of women's softball 
and we don't watch the men's World Series at all. I mean, the, the college World Series. We, we watch we watch the women's. Um, it might be that my wife's from Oklahoma, and Oklahoma happens to be pretty good, but um, the other part of it is we just enjoy it. And I, uh, again, I coached my youngest daughter in softball, so I've been a softball person for a while as well. Very cool. Okay, so final question. What do you think is a trait of someone you know that has helped them be successful? Well, I mean, I, I guess if we want to go with um, a trait from the from the past, if you will, because my my famous favorite person from history, or especially U.S. history, would be Abraham Lincoln. And I think one of the best um, some of the traits that he had that I really enjoy, like is one is um, listen more than you speak. And and second is my favorite quote of his is if I had an hour to chop down a tree, I'd spend 45 minutes sharpening my ax. And, and so it goes down to preparation and that kind of thing. I think those are uh, traits that I think go far um, when it comes to being a successful human being. Well, I think that that is very well said, Jeff, and a wonderful way to wrap up our time here together. So thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast today. And um, yeah, we look forward to visiting with you again in the future. Very good. I enjoyed it. Thanks.